Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to this Lord's Day worship of God. Special welcome to each and every one of you. And as I am calling attention to some of the announcements in the bulletin, I would invite uh, you to please pick up the Ministry of Friendship pew pad. Uh, those of you closest to the aisle will find it beside you. Provide the information requested and please share it with your neighbor beside whom you're worshiping this morning. Um, several announcements. Uh, today we are going to celebrate the elimination of $7.8 million in debt. Hooray! So, um, you know, Presbyterians are just so doggone allergic to debt that we're all just going to breathe easy now. So that's wonderful. Um, and, and, and more of that coming in the service. Several uh, pieces of information. Our Ageless Adventurers have a very uh, busy April, so please avail yourself of all of that information. Our weekday school, who uh, has the best spaghetti in town, by the way, will be having a fundraiser in a couple of weeks. And there is nothing uh, more joyful than watching small children eat spaghetti. You know, if, if, you, if you're ever having a blue day, just feed spaghetti to a small child and watch them, and, and your day will brighten immediately, I guarantee it. Um, you can see that our congregation nominating committee uh, will be uh, beginning its very important work, so there's information that you need to, to avail yourself there. Um, our adult education uh, ministry had two classes that started up today and will run through Pentecost, May 15th. Uh, Charlie, our transitional pastor, is leading a class on transitional uh, issues in congregational ministry. And uh, Dick Betts and Kirsten Sonstegard are leading a parenting class. And I love this title. I wish somebody would have told me this 30-plus years ago, How to Be an Imperfect uh, parent or grandparent. Um, I've got that. I've got that. So any additional uh, announcements that require our attention this morning? Well, thank you, Dan. And uh, one of the reasons why Presbyterians use debts rather than trespasses, <laughs> we'd rather have our debts forgiven. <laughs> Will you join me as we gather together now for our call to worship. God blesses us abundantly with good gifts in every season. God brings to completion all his works. All things become possible with the Lord's help.
Let us join together corporately in our prayer of confession followed by our personal prayers. Let us pray. God of the resurrection, you open the tomb and invite us to sing and dance in the new life you give us. In Jesus Christ, whose wounds are not erased but glorified in resurrection, touch our wounds that they may be transformed into channels of healing for others. Holy Spirit, breathe into us the power to forgive so that all may have new life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. The old has passed away. All has become new. In Jesus Christ, you and I are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Be seated, please. I would like to invite Finley May and her family forward, and uh, Granddad and Elder Tom, who is assisting, and uh, any of the younger children who would like to come forward for a better view of the baptism, uh, please come forward. We need you as well to help with the liturgy. So. Friends, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hear also these words from the Holy Scriptures. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show 
that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate the sacrament. On behalf of the session, we present Finley May Tremper, daughter of David Tremper and Sarah McCubbin, to receive the sacrament of baptism. And to Dave and Sarah, in presenting Finley for baptism, you announce your own faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want her to study Christ, to know Christ, to love Christ, and to serve Christ as a chosen disciple. I ask that you show your purposes by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust him? We do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to Finley? We do. And I need your help right here. Do you promise to be a friend to Finley? And if Finley needs directions, will you show her the way? If she falls down, will you pick her up? And if circumstances allow, will you play with Finley and share with her the stories of Jesus? Will you? Do we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to support and to be friends in Christ to David and Sarah as they guide Finley in faith and to tell the good news to her and help her know all that Christ commands. We do. And I invite you to stand and with the church in every time and place, confess the faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Be seated, please. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into the promised land. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who for us was baptized in the holy waters of Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon us and upon this water that this font may be the place of new birth. May all who pass through these waters be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind Finley to the household of faith. Guard her from all evil. Strengthen Finley to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. To you be all praise, honor, and glory through Jesus Christ our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Say your daughter's name. Finley May Trimper, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit of God descend upon your heart and remain with you always. Amen. We are children of God. Praise be to the Father. Let us sing and welcome Finley into the household of faith. Jesus loves me. 
God of grace, Father of us all, we pray for David and Sarah. Help them to know you, to love with your love, to teach your truth, and to tell the story of Jesus to Finley, so that your word may be heard and bring about the plans for us that you had promised. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. The children may uh, go out to we one's worship or return to their families. Um, and let us take a few moments to pass the peace of Christ as we greet our neighbors beside whom we're worshiping. Scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, the first chapter, uh, reading verses 1 through 14. And here, uh, Luke, who wrote the gospel according to Luke, is giving us the second volume, if you will. And if uh, Luke was all about Jesus, Acts is all about what the Spirit of Jesus does through followers of Jesus. And here we have um, information about God's promise of the Spirit, uh, an account of the ascension of Jesus, and then the disciples returning to their quarters in Jerusalem. So let us now listen to what God has to say to us through this word. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. 
They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, if you have ever wondered about what became of that very earliest community that gathered around Jesus of Nazareth, especially after his crucifixion and his resurrection, Acts will tell you. Acts is volume 2 of Luke's writing. In, uh, this, uh, in volume 1, as we know, Luke tells the story of Jesus. In Acts, volume 2, he tells the story of the followers of Jesus. And it is a remarkable story. And since we will be in Acts through mid-May, I encourage you to read it in one sitting. Now, since December, the narrative lectionary, which is a four-year schedule of readings covering the entire narrative scope of the Bible, the lectionary has had us in Mark's Gospel. Today, the second Sunday of Easter or Easter Tide, the narrative lectionary begins us in our journey through the book of Acts. One of the very last stories in Luke's gospel is the story of the walk to Emmaus. Jesus, as we know, has been arrested, tried, executed. After the Sabbath, some of the women went to Jesus' tomb to anoint his body for burial. And to their alarm, discover it empty. Empty. They saw two angelic beings who recounted what Jesus told them. Jesus said he would be crucified, but on the third day he would rise again. The women remembered and told the disciples what they had seen and heard there at Jesus' tomb. The women's story, however, was dismissed as an idle tale not to be believed. After all, dead people stay dead. That's the natural course of events. Why wouldn't it be an idle tale? Now, two disciples set out for Emmaus. We don't know where Emmaus was. The word means warm spring, and there were numerous warm springs within a stone's throw of Jerusalem. Evidently, this particular warm spring was connected to Jerusalem by a road and was a morning or afternoon's walk away. St. Augustine, the 5th century bishop of Hippo in northern Africa, wrote in his confessions, Salvatur ambulando. It is solved by walking. You know, in the Washington Post last week, there was an article about Matt Sherman. Some of you may have read it. He is one of the longest serving uh, civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Sherman was an attorney for the departments of state and defense. He was in a war zone for about a decade and a half with mission critical tasks to help stabilize profoundly broken societies, Iraq and Afghanistan. And Sherman, now 44 years old, is stateside. And given the intensity of the past decade and a half of his life, he's attempting to adjust to a very different type of life. His immediate plan is to walk the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. And in his own words, he says, I'm going to walk 
until something comes up. And if nothing comes up, I'll keep walking. Salvatur ambulando. It is solved by walking. Sherman's words made perfect sense to me. This is the way I sort things out. It's the way Augustine sorted things out. And I strongly suspect that those two disciples on that road to Emmaus on that day attempted to sort things out this way as well. Because it seems God has a way of getting to us when we put one foot in front of another, when we stay on the journey, when we create, create time and space to be open for what God has for us. The disciples on the road to Emmaus walked, and they talked, and they despaired. Absolutely nothing had turned out as they hoped, or had it. I need to tell you an Uncle Lee story. My Uncle Lee had a gift for turning a phrase just so. And some of his phrases made sense to us, and some of his phrases didn't make any sense to anyone. As a child, the passel of McCoy and Phillips' cousins would assemble during the summer on his farm in the East Tennessee Valley. It was a kid's dreamland. Cow-clad meadows, forests, ponds, amiable dogs, fishing rods, rifles, hay-filled barns, strawberry patches, and one of the cousins was always hatching an adventure or a scheme that promised a day better than yesterday. And it usually involved potential bodily harm. You know, broken bones, stitches, deep bruises. Now, if there was ever any real risk of injury, we would do the most sensible thing, which was to let the younger cousins go first. And we had sometimes run the idea by Uncle Lee, and he would listen. And for example, we would say, you know that, that high branch on the sycamore tree that overhangs the fish pond? We should go up there and put a rope. And after a few moments, he would consider the proposal at hand, and he would look into the distance and say, I wouldn't bet a huckleberry to a persimmon on that notion. A huckleberry to a persimmon on that notion. This was his way of telling us that our idea was half-baked at best. We should reconsider. I tell that story because I want to say this. An empty tomb is not a promising start to saving the whole wide world. An empty tomb is not a promising start to saving the whole wide world. It sounds like the idle tale the early disciples thought it was. The reality is that very few people would have bet a huckleberry to a persimmon that anything would have come of Jesus and his small band of followers. From all appearances, Imperial Rome won. Jesus and his movement lost. You know, historians put the population of the Roman Empire in the year 100 at about 180 million people. They put the number of Christians in the empire at about 1 million. That's less than 1% of the population, 0.6% to be exact. What were the odds that such a small movement could become global in scope and influence? You know, for example, today there are 7.1 billion people on the planet, 2.2 billion of whom are Christian. That's about 31%. I would say those odds would have been long 
In other words, I probably wouldn't have bet a huckleberry to a persimmon, although I haven't priced either lately. Today's lesson involves three scenes. The first scene is Luke recounting for Theophilus God's promise of the Spirit. The second scene is Jesus' ascension to heaven, and the third scene is the disciples' return to their quarters. I want us to focus on the words of the risen Lord right in the middle of our passage. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I have heard a lot of well-meaning, but nonetheless bad sermons on this verse. Usually they are what is known as exhortatory sermons. That is, the preacher exhorts his or her congregation to do this or that, or to think this or that, or to believe this or that, or to be this or that. But in the case of our verse, the exhortation, um, actually in the case of this verse, the exhortation would be something like this. Christians should or must or ought be Christ witnesses everywhere to everyone. Now, for the record, I agree with that or exhortation 100%. But Luke's record of Jesus' words has no imperative tense. There is no must here. There is no should. There is no ought. There is no have to. Jesus isn't commanding his disciples to be witnesses. Rather... He's stating simply that they will be, that they are, that we will be, that we are. After Jesus tells his disciples who they are, witnesses, he ascends to heaven. Now, I could go on at length about the theological import of Jesus' ascension, but um, I will spare us all. But there is literary significance, and I need to point that out. Jesus' ascension into heaven is Luke's device for moving Jesus off stage and moving the disciples to center stage because he wants to tell the story of what disciples in fidelity and obedience to the Spirit of God can get done in the big, wide world. Now, from this point on, Acts tells the story of how the Spirit-led disciples keep saying what Jesus said and keep doing what Jesus did. It appeared that the Jesus movement had come to a screeching halt with Jesus' crucifixion. And Acts wants us and the world to ask, whether that's true or not and points to the many ways that people who bear Jesus' name continue Jesus' work of salvation. You know, Acts is what I would call a mustard seed story. Something very, very small and insignificant becomes very great and profoundly significant. Something far beyond human capacity, something that absolutely has to involve an element of the divine. You know, the emergence of Christianity as a global movement encompassing every region of the globe, every culture, every language group, every race, every ethnicity, a truly universal movement could not have been foreseen. The odds were crazy long. And if it were the doing of humans alone, we would not be here and I would not be preaching this sermon. But Acts wants to say it's God's doing by the Spirit through people just like you, just like me, 
just like the ones we read about in the story. You see, we are witnesses, just as Jesus said. And sometimes we are pretty good witnesses. People see what we say and what we do and how we treat others, and it's good. And a light brightens, and the gospel gains a hearing. But other times, we are lousy witnesses. People see what we say and what we do and how we treat others, and it's bad. And a light dims, and the gospel loses a hearing. Today, we mark a milestone in our congregation. You know, ten years ago, we broke ground on our new facilities. And then eight years ago, we dedicated them to God for Christian ministry in this place. And last month, we eliminated the very last of the $7.8 million debt from our Building to Serve campaign, and that's a witness. And you can say hallelujah if you want. I can't help but think of those five elders on Piccadilly Street in the year 1800. Joseph Gamble and John Bell and James Holliday and Colonel Henry Beatty and Robert Gray and those 40 members, the Bells and Bushes, the Caldwells and Dowdles, the Hennings and Hills, the Hodges and Hollidays, the Mackeys and McGills, the Millers and Morgans, the Slaters and Smiths. On that day in 1800, when Winchester Presbytery organized us then into a congregation of the Presbytery. And think about it. The American Republic was in its infancy. Winchester was a rough frontier town on the edge of the wilderness. And our forebears planted some mustard seeds then, just as Today, we plant more mustard seeds. And perhaps in a century or more, folks will wonder about us as well. Witnesses. That's what Jesus said we are. The 1800 Old Stone Church. Witnesses. The 2016 First Presbyterian Church Congregation. Witnesses. Amen. So now, let's celebrate. I need, first of all, Rich, and anybody else who has a part in our leading our litany. anybody with this thing. Everybody read that? <laughs> you don't need glasses for this. So let's celebrate. And please indulge us. Yes, I, I, if you I don't asked, speak, I'd, I'm going to go away disappointed. I asked Dan whether I could say a couple of words. I don't get a chance to do this very much anymore right now, so who knows where this could go here today. So, anyway, I was delighted to be invited to come back today to take part in this uh, celebration of the culmination of the building project and uh, the elimination of the debt. You know, this was a tremendous undertaking this congregation took. It required tremendous faith and courage. And uh, it, it was just exciting to see it uh, develop over these uh, years and to have this wonderful building which uh, serves the uh, cause of Christ and the community of faith uh, so wonderfully and so, uh, so beautifully. Um, so many people were involved in this, hundreds of, hundreds of people. I, I, I can't help but say, you know, here's Diane and Terry Sinclair over here today, along with the Goffs, they headed up the first campaign, and the Barleys were involved in it, and, and uh, you know, Joe Callback and Don Gansky, everything, just so many of you, hundreds of people. Um, it's interesting, when this building was built, 
uh, it took the congregation 13 years to pay off the debt. Uh, it took us just eight, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, good, and should we should feel great about that. You, you heard in the service today the importance of being witnesses, and what is so great is that you have been witnesses to what God can do through faithful people. You have been a faithful people, and I just rejoice in this day and give thanks to God for all of you on this day. Amen. Um, I'm without a script, so <laughs> let us join in the, uh, the uh, liturgy, the litany uh, of celebration. Look what God can do through faithful people. In the 1730s, God sent evangelists from Pennsylvania's Donegal Presbytery to the Shenandoah Valley to establish new congregations. Look what God can do through faithful people. You've got more. In 1788, Presbyterians erected the Old Stone Church on Piccadilly Street, and in 1800, the Winchester Presbytery organized the worshiping community as a Presbyterian congregation. Look what God can do through faithful people. In 1826, albeit amid controversy, the Kent Street Church was established. Look what God can do through faithful people. In 1839, again amid controversy, the Loudoun Street Church was founded and dedicated its new building, our current sanctuary, in 1841. Look, Look what God, God can, can do to faithful people. In 1900, the Kent Street Church and Loudoun Street congregations merged to form the Winchester Presbyterian Church, which, which was renamed First Presbyterian Church in 1955. Look what God can do through faithful people. In 1963, Boyd Chapel and our educational buildings were erected. Look what God can do through faithful people. In 2000, we celebrated our bicentennial. Look what God can do through faithful people. In 2006, we broke ground on our new facilities and began renovating some of our existing properties. 12 Look. East Cork, Donegal House and Hills Keep. Look what God can do through faithful people. In 2008, we dedicated our new and renovate, renovated facilities. Look what God can do through faithful people. And as of March 1st, 2016, our new and renovated facilities, the culmination of our Building to Serve campaign, are debt free. Look what God can do to faithful people. Oops. That's fine. And elementary school or younger youth, I need you front and center. Can you come help? I need you. And Rich, you're going to be on this side. And so uh, let's unclip this. All right. And hold it up. So. And I want all the children to get on this side and grab a piece. Well, we can actually, let's do it on all sides. How's that? Rich, you'll coach that side. I'll coach this team. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to count down to one, and it's going to be... Okay, good. We're, we're not doing it yet. I'm going to... Um, we're going to... Don't do anything yet. This is a rehearsal. Three, two, one, and I'm going to say hooray, and at hooray... We're going to be done with $7.8 million of debt. Have you ever opened any gifts on Christmas Day? It's kind of like that, but really big. <laughs> so everybody here that needs to be here, ready? Three, two, one, hooray!
Be seated. The words of our hymn, praise God that their joy in giving of themselves despite the costs. With joy and thanksgiving, let us bring our tithes and offerings to God.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours, and of your own we give you. You are the maker of all things, and through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Receive now this invitation to the table, and we will remain seated for the hymn of invitation. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Friends, this is the Lord's table. He invites all who trust him and bear his name to commune with him and with others who trust him and bear his name as well. Let us celebrate the sacrament. Friends, I invite you to join me in the responsive opening to the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Living with you, he prays for us. Lord, hear now the prayers of our hearts as we come before you in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. And Lord, we pray as well for those concerns that folks have shared this morning. We lift before you all who are battling addiction. Lord, in your mercy, heal them. Lord, we pray for Charlotte Lauterbach. Lord, in your mercy, heal her. 
With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this meal that it may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and with all who share the feast. Unite us in faith. Encourage us with hope. Inspire us to love that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. And the scriptures declare that every time we share this bread and this cup, we proclaim the saving death of Jesus Christ until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us celebrate the sacrament.
the blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Together, let us offer the prayer following communion. Lord God, with thankful hearts for all your goodness to us, and especially for your nourishment at this table, we gather to you the worship of our lives this week. May we carry out from here your peace and goodwill, joy into the world you love, and to the people you love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, and return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. traffic up this one. Folks want to visit with you. Sing out for joy. Sing out for joy. Christ is the Oh, yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. It was fun. Good. Why don't you take this door? Yeah, yeah just, just too cold out there. Yeah. Good to see you. Hey, stay warm, stay warm, stay warm. Howdy. Hey, fella. How you doing? We missed you Thursday. I, I missed being there. Oops. Good. Yeah, 25 is great. Howdy. Good to see you. Yeah, just this to 